and we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of this series called Secrets of Greatness. My name is Omar Qadri. I am your host for this show. Today, I have a very, very special guest in the house. His name is Simon Toffel. For all you sports and cricket fans out there, you know who Simon is. And for those of you who don't, Simon is a former cricket umpire who was recognized as the ICC umpire of the year for five years in a row from 2004 to 2008. And that's what I call consistency. Simon retired from the game in 2012 and is now working as a consultant, trainer, and coach, helping organizations and people to be the best versions of themselves. He recently launched his book called Finding the Gaps, which I think is a must read for all of you listening to this particular episode, because in this book, Simon shares with us his deep secrets of success in great detail. Simon, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you with me. Um, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's great to be with you and your audience, and I hope that uh, the next short period of time is uh, both enjoyable and informative. Thank you so much. I'm sure it will be. So let's get right into it. Right? All right. Let's go. Let's call play. So, all right, Simon, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get into umpiring? How did you get into umpiring in the first place and you eventually fell in love with it? Well, I started playing cricket probably a little bit later than most kids around the age of 12 when I started secondary school. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with cricket because at that stage, my parents had divorced and I found what I would call a second family in the sport of cricket. And I lived for Saturday mornings with my junior coach, Brian Opal, and, and his family. And uh, he sort of took me under his wing as a father figure. And, and I really enjoyed what cricket had to offer, uh, that sense of family, that sense of team and belonging, and to be able to just have fun and, and be in the company of other people. So that really appealed to me. And then as I progressed through my secondary school, I then got into coaching other junior teams. Mm -hmm. I really loved to give back. And I then took on a part-time job while I was still at secondary school at an indoor cricket centre run by the great Barry Knight, former oh. England Test cricketer. Yeah. And I did some umpiring of the night time to earn some, some pocket money. And that's probably where umpiring as a, a part-time job, a, a hobby, if you like, really took over. And... Then I became sort of the accidental outdoor cricket umpire. I'd, I'd played a lot of junior representative cricket. I had a back injury and one of my mates oh. decided that he also wanted to become an umpire. So he dragged me along to this umpire's course. Um, we both sort of sat through the course and, and like most training at the end of it, there's an exam to do. Yeah. And uh, luckily I, I got more than 85% and I thought as a, as a university student, uh, how can I earn some some, uh, some money to yeah. get my, my living going. And I started outdoor cricket umpiring. And I must say that I never started, I never started this journey with a view to becoming a first class or an international umpire. Mm -hmm. It's sort of in my DNA just to give it my best and to try to be as good I can, as I can be in anything that I attempt. And uh, quite fortunately in New South Wales, which is my home state, yeah. some excellent, excellent mentors, coaches, people who support um, and provide the experience yeah. and knowledge. And I was really given a really good apprenticeship and that really put me on the path to where I am today. That's, that's amazing. I loved, I really love that because it's, uh, it shows that you have that capacity to be so focused and disciplined in something that you have chosen for yourself. And I think that is so important for everyone listening to the show, right? You, you, you tried out, a new thing for yourself, uh, cricket umpiring after yeah. an injury, after a setback. And you found you fell in love with it because that was something it was not just about the money, but you actually really enjoyed doing that and turned that into a career. I really love that. I, it, it, that's really awesome. That's so, journey had was a hobby. Uh -huh. And then it sort of became a, a part time job and then it became a full time job. So there's a pathway that's so important. It's about what you do next. It's so critical. And at the time, going through my back injury, where I could not do up my shoelaces, where I could mm. not sleep, you know, it's a tremendously awkward, frustrating, yeah. uh, disappointing time. And you've got to show that, that resilience and positivity around that things will get better. 
yeah. and that there may be a silver lining to this. And I'm a big believer that every breakdown leads to a breakthrough. Mm. Uh, and in my book, I talk about some of those examples yes. of some players where I've had some breakdown moments with players that turn into breakthrough moments where we've now got something in common. Yeah. But um, I never thought at the time when I had my back injury that it would put me on a different potential career path to something even better. Yeah, and absolutely. That, well, there's, well, you need a bit of luck. Everyone <laughs> needs a bit of luck. You've got to have that perseverance and positive attitude just to have a go. So true. Positive, positive outlook and perseverance is definitely something that's so important for every single one of us who's looking to succeed in whatever career we choose for ourselves. Simon, there, there were a few things from your book. And by the way, I really loved it. I really enjoyed reading your book. Thank you so much um, for writing it, in fact, right? And um, there, were two, there, there was this quote about discipline um, that you said in your book. And I think that really resonated well with me because I also see myself as a person who's by the books, by the timelines and super, super disciplined um, in, yeah. in his approach. And that quote was the difference between success and failure is discipline. And the second one was the, that the price of discipline is always less than the pain of regret. Tell yeah. us why discipline is so important, especially starting out. Well, I I devoted a whole chapter to this and I've provided 10 tips around, you know, what is self-discipline and why it is so important to, to moving forward. Um, look, in my career, in my, my professional career as a cricket umpire, but also my corporate career in the printing industry mm -hmm. as an operations manager, I come across a lot of people that want things, desire things, aspire to to better things mm -hmm. and we all do that we all have this innate uh, desire to, mm -hmm. to be better to do better to have more things to have nicer cars nicer houses to maybe lose 10 kilos all those sorts of things yeah and their, their dreams aspirations desires we all have them it's, it's quite a very human uh, thing to do yeah but they're, they're great thoughts then we need to turn those into some great words and then we need to turn those into some great actions. And in today's world, um, great leaders, people mm. who achieve good things, have this strong bias towards action. Yeah. And if you are going to, to do anything worthwhile, you've got to get out there and try, and you've got to have a go, and you've got to put things into action. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you'll always be successful, but that's that continuous improvement cycle I talk about in the book about, you know, sticking your neck out, having mm -hmm. a go, learning from the mistakes and keep moving forward. And it's very easy for people to come to me and say, look, I want to be a test cricket umpire. Mm -hmm. um, how do I do that? And I talk about the 10 year apprenticeship and I talk about all those Saturdays and Sundays of going out there, uh, doing things well, making mistakes and then you know, learning from those and getting better. Um, and that doesn't appeal to a lot of people as to put in that, that 10 year apprenticeship. And so I, I do believe it takes 10 years to get to world class in anything, pretty much. You've Absolutely. got to put in those 10,000 hours. Yeah. So that self-discipline that I've, that you've asked me about is really important to stay focused, mm -hmm. to keep your eye on the target. Because if you can't see the target, you're likely going to miss it. Absolutely. It's also important to manage distractions. And in today's world, with so many social media yep. options, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, you name it, there's probably 10 others that you've yeah. got there in North America that I don't have here. <laughs> and <laughs> they take up a lot of time. And you achieve nothing by sitting on your couch or sitting on your mobile phone yeah. and, and, and being distracted from what's important. And I, I think, you know, for me, the, the tips that I offer, the areas that I cover about hard work, about passion, um, and being really clear on what you want to do and, and to have good people around you actually help you get to where you want to be because isn't that yeah. what it's all about? So true. You know, dreaming's free, but the achievers in our world um, get out there and, and they're very focused and they're self-disciplined. Yeah. And that's what it's about. Yeah. And so that's you can do it. In the book, it's about transferable skills. I'm not yeah. about trying to teach people how to umpire. I'm about trying to teach them how to get where they want to get to. Um, exactly. And those are skills that can be transferred in any career, whether you're an umpire, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a sports person or, um, you know, 
anything or you're working in a corporate sector it doesn't matter right those are such important skills and you know that, that the reason why that particular code that you say about the regret piece right and i'm going to repeat it for the uh, listeners again the quote was the price of discipline is always less than the pain of regret and to me that really resonated with me simon because i um i have read this research about uh, from a psychology perspective, there's research that said, you know, they found that the people in their deathbeds, they actually have more regrets about things that they did not do versus the things that they actually ended up doing, right? So, well, yeah. And so as a result, what I always tell my students and people who come to me that, you know, make sure you don't have that regret when you are in your deathbed, right? And so make sure you do the things that you want to do, to you want to achieve. And those are the things that you spoke about right now, right? Whether it's getting a card, losing 10 kilos, whatever it is, you do those things, you create a plan, as you always talk about in the book, prepare, be disciplined. And one other thing that you always mention is find yourself a coach, find yourself a mentor to guide you through the way. And that actually leads me to the next question. Why do you think, Simon, that having a coach or a mentor is so important? And would you be able to maybe tell, give me an example where a coach, having a coach really benefited you? Yeah, it's a great segue, Omar. And for me, one of the things that my first coach did for me mm -hmm. was to ask me a, a tough question, particularly around my brand and what I stood for and how I wanted to conduct myself and, and carry myself. And he asked me the question, what do you want people to say at your funeral? And it's quite a confronting and somewhat a morbid question. Yeah. You know, it's, not, it's not the typical thing that you expect a, a coach to ask you, but it's quite a powerful question. And if you can move past the, the morbidness of it, yeah. And think about, you know, so if someone's going to deliver a eulogy at your funeral, what sort of describing words would you want them to say about you and the way that you conducted yourself, both personally and professionally? Yeah. And whatever your response is, and of course, we all want people to remember us fondly and say nice things about us because we're human and that's, that's the vanity coming through. But it then forces you to think about, well, am I acting consistently? Mm hmm the outcome yeah and I'll, I'll probably just go back to here preparation a little bit yeah, and sure the preparation to give yourself the best chance of getting what you want and getting the the outcome so people use this term high performance and i'm not mm. really comfortable with high performance but performance is about giving yourself the best opportunity to get the result you're looking for and right. to do that you need to start with the outcome in mind so coaching Coaching is about asking really good questions. Mm -hmm. Coaches should challenge you. If you've got a coach that are telling you what to do, they're not drawing out. They're not actually giving you any degree of self-sufficiency and helping you self-discover your opportunity to get better. Um, so when you tell people something, mm -hmm. it's a very short, fast-tracked way of getting to where you want to get to, perhaps. But it's not really sustainable because what yeah. happens when your coach leaves that environment and there's no one to tell you what to do. So for me, good coaching is about asking good questions. And that was one particular really tough question my coach asked me early on. And I grew up in an environment, as I said, in New South Wales, with really good mentors and trainers and um, people around me that were very knowledgeable. But then I also had a Cricket Australia system where they were the best team in the world at the time. Yeah. And I was able to tap into the, the coaches that were working with the team. And so I, I tapped into their fitness coach, I tapped into their dietitian, but I also had my own financial coach. No, um, nice. You know, and I had my, my life coach, which is the question that I mentioned before. Yeah. I've still got him today. And he also asked me other questions about who's in my A team. Hmm. Who are the people around me that actually will continue to challenge me and who, who do I have coffee with? <laughs> who do I have coffee with? Because these are the sorts of influences. And if you surround yourself with really good people, and one of the 
the, the tips I think I talk about with leaders and managers who are world class is that you need to employ people that are smarter than you. Yes. And, and I try to find coaches or people in my A team that are smarter than me. Mm -hmm. I want to tap into what's made them successful and how do I learn from their experience? Yeah. And so coaching is really, really intrinsic. It's an important element to self-challenge, but also to hold you accountable. Yes. If they will ask you, well, have you done it? Yeah. Where is your plan? Yeah. Or you said you were going to do that. Can you show me there how you've done it? Or can you share that with me? And, and so accountability, if you, can't, if you haven't got the self-discipline to keep yourself accountable, maybe you need a coach. Exactly. Someone your network to keep you accountable. And that's how it starts. And I couldn't agree more. So, so, you know, um, one of the things, Simon, you, you say about the eulogy piece, I kid you not, I kid you not, three-ish three years ago, when I got into my own personal self-introspection uh, um, journey and self-discovery journey, that was one of the first exercises I came across and I did it myself. And to me, that was a game changer. You know, it really helped me uh, see myself from a different perspective altogether. And with the students that I work with, the people that I coach and mentor now here in, uh, here in Toronto, that is one of the first exercises I give to all of them. Think about your eulogy. And sometimes they all, and, and you know, they come back to me and they always have trouble. They're like, it's so hard, Omar, it's so hard to put yourself, you know, in uh, so far ahead in the future and look back. And I'm like, yeah, it is supposed to be hard. I'm not going to give you anything that's really easy because no, nothing that's really worth world, it comes easy. Sorry to interrupt, but in the corporate world, we do a lot of what's called 360 reviews. Mm -hmm. We have colleagues and suppliers and, and other people in our network yeah. that would provide us with descriptives around what we do well, where we could improve, etc which can be quite confronting. Yeah. And when you get that feedback, it makes you reflect. Now, uh, I'm here to say to you and your audience that it's important to be trying to get better every day. You don't mm. know how good you can be and you don't know how far you can go until you try, until you just keep going. And I think it's really important not to focus overly too far into the future and realize that's a mountain that's far too big to climb but it's about small wins, small Absolutely. daily shift of improvement. So the cricket umpire, how can I get better every game? Yeah. When I talk to corporate leaders and, and managers about, well, how often do you self-assess your day's work? You know, do you do a self-assessment at the end of the week? What did I do well? What could I do better? And what should I try doing? Or in my world, keep doing, stop doing and start doing. Yes. Um, and it's about keeping it relatively simple and making small adjustments to make every day your best day. And if you just keep focusing on making every day your best day and small improvements over time, you know, that leads to really good outcomes. Absolutely. I, you know, um, funny story. Um, I, uh, that framework that you just spoke about, the uh, uh, keep doing, the start doing stop and the doing, stop doing. Stop. Yeah. That I, 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 I saw that in your book and I really liked it. And with my personal A team, the pe people who give me the feedback that I need and my trusted advisors, I actually mm -hmm. kind of have a uh, ongoing uh, Google spreadsheet going on where I have these three columns. And after every, for example, after watching every episode or every workshop or every webinar that I do, my yeah. A team goes in there and types out their, um, their feedback in that format. And then I yeah. review it. And that's, that's, you know, that's uh, something that I learned from you from your book. So thank you so much for that. And I incorporated it in my uh, personal development. Well, well done on you, Omer, because it takes a lot of courage to be able to, you know, look at that information and actually, you know, look at the brutal honesty and challenge yourself to be open-minded about it and not just be dismissive and say, oh, that, that doesn't apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the good news. Don't worry about the bad stuff. <laughs> You know, that, and that's the, that's the process of improvement that we, we're talking about, right? That's the iterate. It's everything is iterative. You, there's no, Rome was not built in a day. So transfer, if you're looking for your own personal transformation, it's not going to happen in a day. One bit no. at a time, as just Simon just, as Simon no, no, just said. And that, 
that attitude and that process is a skill and it yeah. takes time to develop that skill. And you've got to be very patient with yourself and mm-hmm. you've got to really talk kindly to yourself. And that's sometimes why you need that coach, you need that mentor, Absolutely. you need that person in your corner because you're going to have bad days, you're going to have disappointments, yeah. you can have days where you, it's just not working for you. And that's where you need people to put their arm around your shoulder and pick you up and help you get through it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Simon, let's also talk about now um, leadership, another okay. very important subject, something that a lot of my students and the people that I mentor and coach, they always talk about. They want to be great leaders of tomorrow, right? And that's great. I love hearing that from, uh, from these kids and from the youth that I work with. Okay. While talking about leadership in your particular book, you spoke highly about two people in particular that I want to point out. One, Steve Waugh. And the second one being Virat Kohli. Tell me, you have the, you've had the, you know, uh, the experience of being close to them and working together with them and um, being on the field together. What well, makes these guys the great leaders that they are? I'm out of time to, to talk about leadership as a massive concept. But yeah. I do enjoy working with lots of people on this subject because there is so much information out there about leadership. To, to cut to the chase, the adaptive style of leadership is the best one for me. And sometimes mm-hmm. you need to lead from the front. Sometimes you need to lead from behind. But above all, you need to lead by serving others. And you mentioned a couple of good names there that I've talked about with Steve Waugh. So let's start with Steve. Steve was captain of Australia when I did my first test in Boxing right. Day 2000. Um, Steve, for me, is someone who leads by example. He He demonstrates the qualities that he would like to see the rest of his teammates adopt and accept. Mm-hmm. And how does he do that? Well, if, if you had a cricket team and you were in trouble on day five and you were the batting team and you had to bat to save the test match, I think most people would agree you'd want Steve Waugh in the batting lineup, probably next to Raul Dravid. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, probably. People who show tremendous grit, resilience, and never give up. And I think that's a quality in leadership that's really important, that tenacity, that grit. Mm -hmm. But also to not leave it to someone else. When there's a tough job to do, that, you know, Steve's the type of character that if he sees a problem or a challenge, he doesn't give it to someone else. He Mm -hmm. says, well, you know, for me, I need to be the person, I need to be the man, I need to step up and not leave it to the rest of my team. Yeah. And that's a tremendous leadership quality in itself is that you don't ask other people to do things that you're not prepared to do themselves. And it's also a quality that I've seen in Virat Kohli. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that? Well, if you look at the Indian cricket team of today, I think it's fair to say that they would be the fittest, leanest, most agile Indian cricket team that I've seen in a long time. Absolutely. And Virat's influence on that type of element of that team is significant because Virat himself is lean, agile, and probably one of the most fittest. uh, In the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And the other quality that I really admire in Virat as he continues to mature as a leader is his ability to support the rest of the team and to put the the other team members ahead of him. And I'll give you a very recent example of that. I was fortunate Mm -hmm. enough to be in the pink ball test match in Kolkata in Mm -hmm. November of last year. Yeah. And they beat Bangladesh quite convincingly inside three days. And he was given the the trophy uh, at the post-match ceremony with the broadcaster and did his post-match interview. And in the meantime, the rest of the team were off to the side, gathering behind uh, the winners placard and banner and so he had all the squad with the support staff there waiting for Virat to come across for the trophy. Now where would you expect most captains, most leaders to go and stand when they join their team? Where do you think they'd go? Right in the centre. Right in the centre. Well what Virat did on this occasion was he gave the trophy to a member of the squad who was not part of the playing 11 and that player stood in the centre and then Virat went to stand on the end of the team with the support staff while they then celebrated the victory in front of all the cameras in the crowd. And what that showed to me was Virat's philosophy on his role as a leader, which was to, mm-hmm. for sure, 
you know, to, to make the decisions and to be um, you know, the person who gave the post-match interviews. But it's all about team success. Yeah. It's all about lifting other people up and trying to make sure that, that, they, that they are successful too. And I see this in Mahala J. Wardner as well, is that when the team does well, mm-hmm. the captain normally gives credit. The good captains give credit to the team. When the team doesn't do well, they take responsibility for the defeat. And what I saw in Zerat on this day was a maturity in his leadership where it was about team success and not him being the centre of attention. Uh, and I think that's really important for leaders yeah. to really start to think about is that service-based leadership uh, is fundamental to success through teamwork. So true. Um, you know, and, and they're just a couple of examples with those particular gentlemen around leadership that I really respect and admire and I think that we can learn from. I couldn't agree more. That is so, that those are such great examples and I love the fact that you shared those with us. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. I think, you know, even my mentor, Simon, he told me something very simple and something very similar to what you have spoken about. He said to me that, Omar, if you want to be a leader, find yourself a purpose to serve. Find yourself a purpose to serve and just work relentlessly towards that, uh, that, uh, that purpose, that cause, because mm. servitude is what leadership is all about, right? And that's what he said. And that has yeah. been in my mind. That has just stuck in my mind. And to me, whatever I'm doing, it's all about giving back. It's about serving a particular cause. It's all about servitude. Whether I get recognized for it or not, I don't care as far as, as, as long as I'm able to impact X amount of people, certain amount of people, I'm happy with that. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. We could talk about it for hours, but I know. You know, when you think about the great leaders of the world, you think about Mahatma Gandhi, you think about Mother yes. Teresa, you think about Nelson Mandela, you know, people who served a cause and put the cause ahead of their own personal interest. And, yeah. and on the flip side of that, when you see selfish self, uh, leadership, uh, that's not sustainable. And those people yeah. don't stay around very long. They, yeah, because the tough part, uh, it's, it's, they say it's a lot easier to get to the top than to maintain it, right? So it's unsustainable, absolutely. And on no, that one top- of the challenges in my field, of course, is how you, getting to the top is hard, but staying there is even harder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's true. That must be much better. Um, the, one thing, uh, the one thing, Simon, that every single leader of this world, whether in the past or in the present, um, has encountered is failure, right? Every leader has encountered failure in some way or the other. Tell us about your experience with failure. When did you fail? Tell us a story. And um, how did you bounce back? I look, I started my umpiring career, if we're talking cricket, thinking that I was bulletproof and that I'd never make a mistake. How wrong was I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, mistakes are part of umpiring and we, we're sort of basing our discussion around cricket umpiring a little bit. But, um, you know, I mentioned that term before called continuous improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we looked at that as a vicious circle, up the top you would have your plans and your goals and then you would move on to performance and then you get over here to um, feedback and self-assessment and then you go back to plans and goals and then you go back to performance so that continuous improvement cycle is about planning and goal setting uh, performance self-assessment and feedback then we go back to planning and goal setting Mm -hmm. performance self-assessment and feedback and it goes round and round and that's how we get better all the time but you know setbacks mistakes are part of learning and advancement We, we know that I think most of us are intelligent enough to understand that. However, at the time, the human emotion of making a mistake, um, maybe being uh, sacked from your job, maybe not. One of the things about setbacks that I've learned throughout my career and you know, the failures and the mistakes is that they're all attached to emotion. Mm. And we all want people to say nice things about us. Um, yeah. And whenever we don't get promoted, whenever we're excluded from a team or uh, we lose something or we stuff up, it hurts. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, and it, it's a natural human emotion. Um, for me to be able to move forward faster, to, to take the learnings, mm. is to look at the situation more rationally. 
yeah. and take some of the emotion out of it. Uh, that's easier for some people and harder for others, but it does help you move through a setback faster. Is if you take out that emotion and say, okay, what's the learning here? Mm. What can I take away? Uh, and, and again, coaching, powerful questions. If I had my time again today, yeah. what would I do differently? If I had this opportunity again, what would I do differently? And how do I take responsibility for what's not working rather than play blame or play victim? And so whenever I hear people or myself blaming other people or playing victim about the environment, you know, I, I can't do it because the government won't let me or the rules won't let me, etc. I'm not taking responsibility for my opportunity and what I can do differently. So they're very interesting concepts around you know, recovering from setbacks. And you asked me to talk about an example. In the book, yeah. I talk about my worst. So I'm, I'm going to talk about my worst test match um, in England. Tell and us. Our best, our best performance will be on TV and our worst performance is going to be on TV. And on this particular occasion, I made a mistake on day one and I, I was really hard on myself. Mm. I was really disappointed. I got back into the dressing room. They told me I made a mistake. I should have given a batsman out, I didn't. And I thought, well, my, my game is gone. You know, my, my excellent performance is not achievable now. Yeah. And I started to think about things afterwards, about what people were gonna say, rather than just focusing on what's in front of me right here, right now. Because what's worse than making one mistake is two. <laughs> and on this particular occasion, I made six or seven over oh. the course of the test match. And how I got myself into that state is really important for people to understand, is that when we make a mistake, and on this occasion, I really, I beat, I beat myself up. I was very hard on myself. I was very unforgiving. I was very unsupportive. And I was worrying about what people were gonna say, mm. or what was gonna happen afterwards, or how did I get to this position, rather than reconnecting with the moment and doing the best I could with right. what was in front of me. And so that manifested itself into more mistakes, more mistakes, more mistakes. Um, and I took some really interesting learnings away from that game. But I'll be very upfront and I'll be very honest with you and your audience. At the end of that test match, mm -hmm. I hopped on the plane and I thought seriously about, do I really want to be a cricket umpire? Is this what international cricket is all about? Do uh -huh. I really want to go through this again? And of course, it's all about choice. You know, after something happens, we can choose what to do next. And I chose to read a book. And the book was by Brad Gilbert. It was called Winning Ugly. Famous tennis Winning player Ugly. and a great coach. And the penny dropped for me at that stage. And I understood, I was able to reconnect with how I got to that point. And I could have chosen to give up and, and said, look, this is not for me. I don't want to feel this way again. Uh, I don't want people to write bad stuff about me. Or I can learn from it and see how far I can go. You obviously know what I chose to do. <laughs> of course. If someone, if someone had said to me at that moment, don't worry, Simon, in three or four months later, you'll be getting up on a stage in London and accepting the inaugural David Shepherd ICC Umpire of the Year Award, I would have told them, you're crazy. There's no way that's going to happen. I've just had my worst game. That'll never happen. So... It's, it's, it's reconnecting with that rational thought about what is the learning opportunity mm -hmm. here. You've had the pain. Yeah. You've paid the price. You might as well get the learning out of it and take that forward because that's what's experienced. And, exactly. You know, that's part of the apprenticeship. It's part of getting better. And for any of the, the listeners out there that might be inventors or people who work in manufacturing, is it the only way that you get better is by making mistakes. Exactly. And if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, the vacuum cleaner, you know, Dyson, um, you know, he made 5,000 mistakes before he got to a prototype that he was happy with. And he's still working on it. And they're he's... still developing it. And they're still improving it. And I think that's part of the exciting nature about what we do. Yeah. But always looking to get better. Always looking to. And I love that. I really love that example because... It really shows, regardless of which um, 
career path you have chosen, you will make mistakes. You will have those kind of bad days like you had. You didn't have just a bad day. You had like five bad days in a row, I guess, to get to a point where you had so many mistakes in a test match. And yeah. the interesting thing that uh, the brain does in those situations is we have this um, amygdala hijack, right? We have the amygdala hijack, which is yeah. basically the, the hot part of our brain as Dr. Walter Mischel um, a famous psychologist, he calls it, he calls it the hot part of our brain, uh, which controls our emotions. And once that hijack really happens, mm. you are no, the prefrontal cortex, which is more of the cold side and the, more of the rational part of the brain, it just lose, it, it has absolutely no control. And as a result of that amygdala hijack, you are unable to really think rationally about how do I learn from that mistake immediately and you yeah. just go down into that downward spiral of making more and more. And probably that's what happened with you. And sometimes that happens with the best of us, right? So as you said, I love the fact that, you know, what you talked about, the best thing you can do is just keep pushing forward and pick the learnings from that moment. If not immediately, then, you know, sooner rather than later, pick your learnings and move forward with it. And I love that's that. What I'm it's a skill in itself to be able to move forward. It's a skill to be able yeah. to practice that mental toughness, that resilience Absolutely. To, to really control your thoughts and not let them control you and realize that you have that ability to make smarter decisions about what to think about and when to think about them and to recognize those signs, those red flags, when you are being emotionally hijacked. It's really yes. important. That's, and that's so a important. That we would do with you know, teams and groups of people. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so important. The more you practice and the more you are, you re, you are aware of, oh, oh, the amygdala hijack is about to happen. I'm about to yeah. lose control. That's where you're actually making that self-transformation about yourself because having that self-awareness is the first step to making corrections for the future. So yeah, so, so well put, so well put, Simon. Thank you. So Simon, that actually brings us towards the close. This was absolutely phenomenal. I had such a wonderful time. Thank you so, so much for sharing such amazing insights and golden nuggets with us. And you've been an incredible guest. And I really, really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And before I leave, I want to remind all the listeners out there to please get your hands on Simon's latest book called Finding the Gaps. It's available on Amazon. That's where I got it. And I promise you that you will not regret reading this particular book. Simon, any last parting uh, words of wisdom from your end? Uh, look, I, I just would love people to connect with the thought and the concept. But look, I'm just a cricket umpire and uh, I'm very lucky to have had a, a good career. And, and it's important that we all look for ways to get better but to realize that we're human too and that, you know, we all have our shortcomings and I'm far from being perfect. Um, you know, and some of my best feedback come from my kids and my wife about what I don't do well. Um, and we all need those checks and balances. But um, I think in this current environment where, you know, the environment is really challenging and opportunities may seem relatively restrictive. I think it's really important to focus on what we can do yeah. and, and to have that attitude of, you know, um, positivity mm -hmm. and looking for ways to focus on what we can control and to look for small wins and small achievements and to probably give ourselves a bit of a break, not be too hard on ourselves yeah. and not take life too seriously. But look, if, if I can open minds uh, through cricket, if I can share some of my experiences and help people be the best they can be, then that's a great outcome. But Amir, thank you very much for your time. And I hope um, you continue to do well in your chosen field. And I look forward one day to getting to North America and, and seeing your great country. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. The pleasure is all mine. And I would love to someday welcome you to Toronto, to Canada, a country that I love, I fell in love with, and I chose to be in this country. So Wonderful. hopefully you. see you soon at some point. And good luck with all your future endeavors, Simon. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.